Welcome everyone once again. Uh, let's talk about politics and governance. And we hear a lot about globalization being dead with all the trade wars, anti-globalization movements. But my guest today, Lukas Linsky, looked um, uh, at data on companies investing across borders, even those during uh, during those rough times. Well, and globalization seems to be alive and well alive. Companies are still putting their money all over the world. Even the US kept investing in China during their trade war. So well, it seems globalization isn't going anywhere. It's just changing, adapting to uh, the new world order. And we're, uh, we're going to hear more about it now. Lucas, welcome to our episode. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for the introduction. And thank you for having me. Look, as you and your co-author acknowledge uh, in your article, a growing sentiment against globalization, uh, rising political tensions, but also a lack of clarity on what deglobalization means. So tell me more about that. Yeah, so without any doubt, the last decade or so has been quite tumultuous for the, the global economy. Right, We had Brexit, the election of Trump in 2016, followed by the, the COVID pandemic and the Ukraine war. So there's kind of really big shocks to the global economy. And there's been strong shifts in how policymakers and also academics talk about the global economy and, and about globalization. But as you point out, indeed, we emphasize in our article that there's not so much conceptual clarity about what we really mean, what is changing. And a, a big word is, is deglobalization, right? And then others that people talk about is decoupling, de-risking, or, or geoeconomic fragmentation. And there are other terms. And they're often used interchangeably, but we make the case that there's actually quite different things. And what is so important is that some of these concepts or phenomena are actually quite compatible with more integration, with more globalization than others. So for us, I think deglobalization would be a phenomena where the integration of the economy actually declines. So the share of trade or foreign direct investment flows, the share of GDP will be going down. So that would be kind of deglobalization, so less integration, but decoupling or de-risking are actually quite different. So decoupling is especially the West and China moving apart from each other. That's a possibility. We don't find evidence that this is the case, but even if it was the case, so if US and China move apart from each other, it does not necessarily imply that there is less globalization overall, because they can be accompanied by deeper integration within the Chinese bloc and the Western bloc. And even more so about the idea of de-risking, which is uh, that uh, like suppliers and companies should diversify the suppliers away from China. That logically actually even implies that there should be more globalization rather than less. Maybe they move out of China, but they will be setting up new factories that maybe in Vietnam, in Mexico, in Malaysia, as kind of backup options that they can fall back upon. And if this is what this deglobalization rhetoric encourages, it might actually, in this kind of a paradox, lead to more rather than less globalization at the bigger aggregate level. So I think in our article, we try to push uh, us as scholars uh, to think a bit more, more carefully about what we actually mean when we talk about uh, deglobalization, because I think there's very different scenarios, but, which can have very different implications for the global economy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's uh, let's go a little bit deeper on how uh, on how you got into that. So tell us more about your study, what you specifically looked at, which is foreign investment. You'll tell us more about that and the main findings, the main highlights of your study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the study was inspired by this <clears throat> discursive shift. We also observed, right, that the, uh, a lot much more skepticism of globalization and then uh, the Trump administration and also increasingly the EU, the pushback against globalization. What we were interested to know is to what extent does this actually affect what firms do and what kind of deglobalization that is leading to. So our starting point was actually... Our expectation was that there was some kind of a deglobalization because there was so much talk about this, but we saw that there is not so much evidence or empirical studies on this. And so we tried to, to kind of fill this gap and, and look at it empirically. And we also thought that it might be useful to shift this from the level of states, which we usually talk about, like trade between two countries, to the level of firms, which are the entities that actually do the trading. And we looked at different kinds of data sources, FDI, but also firm level data, also survey management, <clears throat> miniature survey level evidence. And we tried to examine, so what kind of deglobalization is actually happening? But what we did find uh, by doing this analysis was actually that we found that there's actually no deglobalization happening at all. We actually found it to be 
quite the opposite. And that was really surprising uh, to us as well in, in the first instance. And particularly if we look at the US-China relationship, which we say is some kind of a most likely case of deglobalization, where you would expect it to happen first and be more visible, we actually found that the US companies during the Trump presidency and the US-China trade war, how people have labeled it, actually there were pretty significant increases in investments from American multinationals in China. And, and we found that that was really not, not, not what we had expected. Uh, and, and we were surprised. And then in our article, we tried, we tried to make some sense of, of, this, of this finding. Uh, so I read uh, from this that apparently political rhetoric and corporate actions not always match. Uh, we need to kind of rethink these assumptions about deglobalization. So who can learn from these findings and what can they learn? Yeah, so I think the findings overall hopefully can contribute to correct some of the biases that are maybe in the more common sense kind of interpretations and discourses about the current state of globalization. I think independently from whether one thinks that globalization is a good thing or a bad thing, it is just the fact that global production today is very deeply uh, globalized through fairly complex production networks. And it will be very difficult, maybe it's even impossible to, to really deglobalize the economy again, or if one would do so, the costs would, would be e extremely high. And we talked about the, the case of moving away from China, that might be possible to, to force companies, to uh, Western companies to leave China, but if they do so, it will probably not mean that they will move back to their home states. It will mean that they maybe move to, to a third country, which, again, is, is quite different from the idea of having deglobalization and things becoming more national again. It's rather that there will be different types, maybe rearranged kind of production networks, but they remain deeply global. And so I think our bottom line suggestion is that globalization is not going to end. It's going to stay with us, whether one likes that or not. I think that's uh, simply a fact. Well, we have there a good punchline for the whole episode, but we'll uh, go back to that. Uh, <laughs> so what do you, academically, what's ahead of us now? So what should uh, future studies focus on? Yeah, so I think in our study, we find, as you pointed out, that there is quite a gap between the discourse of policymakers on the one mm -hmm. hand and what firms seem to be actually doing on the other hand. At the same time, of course, our paper is still relatively early, right? We only have data up to 2021, 22, and things are, are still moving, still, still changing. So we're also not suggesting that nothing is changing at all. Like, and we think there are uh, things that are evolving. There are some transformations. Also looking at the, what the manager says of companies, they are increasingly concerned about geopolitical pressures. If you talk to, for example, managers of US firms in China, it's clearly more on the radar. They are looking at different alternatives. So things are in motion. But how we uh, also phrase it in the article, what we think is happening is not so much uh, move towards deglobalization, but rather re-globalization. So that there is some kind of adapted new forms of internationalization and there might be some more geoeconomicization of, of the infrastructures of, of globalization. But we don't really yet understand very well what is really happening and how it is happening and what is really changing and what stays the same. So, and I think that uh, leaves a, a very big and important uh, field of research that we hope we, we can study uh, going forward to get a better grasp of, of in what ways globalization is actually adapting to this uh, growing uh, geopolitical rivalry between the main powers. Perfect. Uh, you mentioned uh, before how you were a bit surprised with some of the findings, especially the growing investment of U.S. multinationals in China during this special trade war. So let's follow up on that. What were some of your personal thoughts uh, after looking and after reflecting on the findings? Yeah, so <clears throat> to make sense of it, uh, I think we, we looked at especially at, at this manager level survey data, which I think gives us some insights about how, how the managers think. And so what's, wh how we can explain it, I think is on the one hand that at, at this point, for the first Trump presidency, that there was still the trade war and 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 the pressures to deglobalize was still quite the discursive and maybe companies didn't really think that it 
would be all that serious and maybe more temporary. So, so the, the, we're not too concerned about it if you look at the service from 2016, 2017, 18. But actually, we see that this thing started to change towards the later years of the Trump administration and also with Biden, that, that it starts to more sink in that, that, that this might be here to stay. But then from the firm perspective, the main question is so for them, it's really difficult for many of these, especially manufacturing sector. There, there are not that many alternatives to the Chinese economy because it's a hyper competitive kind of ecosystem and environment that has really efficient and productive producers of, of certain inputs that they cannot just easily get anywhere else. In addition to that, also for more services industry, China is a huge consumer market for many of the services industries that have been thriving on gaining more access to, to the Chinese consumer market. So for both set of companies, they really want to stay in China. So, so leaving China is, is not their preferred option. That is, that is pretty clear. But on the other hand, over time, they start to realize more and more that there are uh, these real risks and the political risks are growing. So what we see is the, the, the main response the companies are thinking about is not so much to leave China, but rather to duplicate maybe their presence in China in another country to have some kind of, of backup or to insulate their uh, their presence in China through maybe legal changes that instead of having, being a foreign company, you can turn it into a more domestic vehicle legally. And that in those ways, they try to find ways that they can stay in China without exposing them too much to the geopolitical risks. And that uh, this increase in investment over that time period is also partly reflected in, in that kind of strategic response by multinationals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh Globalization is here to stay, whether we like it or not, was a great punchline you said a little bit mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. But I always ask uh, our authors uh, to close this episode. In no more than two sentences, if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk, what would it be? Yes, it's that there is this gap between how we talk about globalization and the current state of globalization and what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. And that things maybe not all is as dark as it may sound in the news media and that we need to also try to understand more how globalization is changing rather rather than assuming that that it's uh, at the at that end an optimistic punchline lucas yes. thank you very much <laughs> thank you for having me thanks so, for the conversation for all of those who are watching us on youtube in the description of the video you can find all the resources all the materials of this conversation that lucas and i uh, just talked and also in the let's talk about politics and governance website and you can also uh, get your link to the newsletter to the twitter and to the website <laughs>